Hello, and welcome to Analyzing the Script for Design. Now, why do we analyze the script? Well, understanding the story will allow us to tell it better. If we don't know what our script is about, what our play is about, then how can we turn that into visual and audio representations to show the audience? We can't help the audience understand the play if we don't understand the play. It also limits disagreements between the action of the play and the design. I don't know if any of you have ever been to a play that the action, what the performers were doing and what the play was about, really clashed with the design. For example, uh, we could have Shakespeare, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, but for some weird reason it's placed in an office building without any of the characters or the action of the play changing. It doesn't make sense because Romeo and Juliet are about two conflicting families and it takes place in a bunch of different areas including houses, churches, and crypts. So to put it in an office building without changing the dialogue or the action of the play would be really odd and confusing. And the third reason is to support the intent of the playwright and purpose of the play. The playwright knows the play better than we will ever know the play because the playwright is the creator of the play. It's our job when we are designing for a particular play to help the playwright tell their story, to uphold the purpose of the play. Now, we might have some really interesting design ideas. For example, at one point I wanted to design the play Othello, Shakespeare's Othello, um, but do the costumes as if it was very um, Picasso-esque um, from a lot of different angles and uh, have everything be very disjointed on the costumes. Now, I did end up talking the director into letting me do it because I, I talked about how the um, disjointedness of all the lies uh, that were told in Othello and all the different ways the character saw Othello as the Barbary sheep and as someone who needed to be put in their place, but also as someone who was very brave and to be looked up to and the way that Desdemona saw him as this amazing man who she loved um, went along really well with the idea of Picasso's cubism and looking at one thing from a lot of different angles and trying to portray all of those angles into one image. Um, now I was able to talk the director into allowing me to design the play that way. Um, did it really support the purpose of Othello? Mm, probably not. Uh, did it look really cool? Yes, it did. Did the audience sitting there looking at my costumes, did it help them understand Othello? Uh, that's to be decided. I'm going to go with no, it did not. Um, my design for Othe Othello was therefore not successful. My designs, although I thought they were really cool, didn't really help support the playwright, didn't help support Shakespeare's idea of what Othello was, or support the purpose of the play. So, how do we analyze a play? So our first step is to da -da -da -da, read it. Who would have thought? So when given the, the, a new play to design, the first thing you have to do is, in read it for, is to read it for enjoyment. Find something you like about it, even if it's not your kind of script, if it's a, a theater for young audiences piece and you don't love theater for young audiences, guess what? You still have to design it. You need to find something that you do like about it, whether or not that's uh, one of the character's arcs or if it's um, uh, the dialogue, or maybe there's one song in the whole play that you really like if it's a musical. Find something you like about the script. Um, a designer who doesn't like the script, it becomes really obvious because you don't do as well 
uh, as a designer. And the design doesn't read as well because we put into a design how we feel. So find something you like about the play. Hopefully you can find more than one thing, but find at least one thing you really enjoy about the play before you start designing it. Step two, determine the theme, moral, symbolism, and mood. Now these are big picture things. We do tend to start with the big picture and then narrow it down um, to the uh, really small minutia of the play. So our first big picture thing is theme. Um, so the theme, beyond the plot, beyond the series of events, first this happens and then this happens and this happens and then this happens, but what is the work about? What is the truth of life that the, pray, that the play presents. So sometimes this uh, can be discovered directly through the dialogue, through the lines that the characters say. For example, the ending soliloquy of A Midsummer Night's Dream. If we spirits have offended, think but this and all this mended, that you have just rested here while these spirits did appear. Right, it's about how um, life is a dream and um, about how nothing is really permanent and that uh, we're all just sort of stumbling around, sleepwalking, um, until we find that one thing that wakes us up. Now, sometimes it, begin, it can be discovered through the action of the play. So if you know Oedipus Rex, you know that Oedipus struggles against fate. Um, there's a prophecy that Oedipus is going to kill his father and marry his mother, and he fights through the whole play um, uh, to not have this this prophecy come true and then at the end it turns out that he has in fact murdered his father and married his mother even before the play even began this happened so the theme of that is that if you struggle against fate it doesn't matter that everyone has a fate and it will all come true in the end um, it's pretty nihilistic that way um, and sometimes the theme is repeated throughout the work uh, if you've seen Hamilton uh, the musical Hamilton, it's great. Um, you know that the theme is this idea of living on through the legacy um, of what you do and your actions and that that can make you basically immortal um, going through life. Not, not you specifically, but um, your reputation and the knowledge of you. We see this several times throughout Hamilton in different songs, um, who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Um, and then at the end, when we have uh, the Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story reprise, uh, at the very end, when um, Eliza dies, Hamilton's wife dies, um, he, he comes and gets her. He's already dead. Uh, sorry, spoiler alert. He's already dead. And she dies, and he, he takes her a walk around the stage, sort of leading her to heaven. And then at the end, he leads her out onto the front of the stage to look at the audience, and she does this gasp. Um, because it's as if he has taken her into the future and shown her that there is now um, uh, an actual play uh, about his life, which she tried so hard um, to, to have live on after him. She did all these things. Um, and about his, his journey, and he wanted to die for something. He wanted to be remembered, and now he is. So... It's repeated so many times throughout Hamilton that it really sort of brings that particular theme home to the audience. Our second big idea is moral. So the moral is the lesson the author is trying to teach the audience. Now, not every play has a moral. Every play does have a theme, but not every play has a moral. Now, the plays that do have a moral, these are usually presented through the main character who learns a lesson and is rewarded for good deeds or punished for misdeeds. For example, um, Every Man is a morality play, um, a medieval morality play. These plays existed to teach morals, morality play, morals. Um, and now Every Man, who represents every person on earth, um, he tries to get his friends who are named strength and beauty and friendship and other sort of very uh, symbolic names to follow him into death 
Um, however, only one friend, which is Good Deeds, does. And this whole play exists to teach the audience um, the reaffirming Christian idea that the only thing that a person has as they journey to heaven or to the not heaven um, is their good deeds. And that's the only thing that will follow them into the afterlife. So this play, this morality play, existed to teach um, the Christian ideals and morals to medieval audiences. Not all moral, mor not all plays that have morals were morality plays. There are plenty of contemporary plays with morals in them, um, but uh, Every Man is the perfect example of a play with a moral, and it does happen to be a medieval morality play. Our third big idea is symbolism. Now, a symbol implies greater meaning than the literal suggestion, and is usually used to represent something other than what it is at face value. So. Um, you have uh, symbols, which are usually visual things, um, uh, and they represent um, an idea or meaning um, within the play. Now, these visual things can be characters, colors, movement, specific costume props or parts of the set. For example, in the play Red, there is a piece of art. It's about Rothko, the painter Rothko, if you know um, of him and his work. Uh, there's a piece of art, and it represents mortality and the inevitability of becoming inconsequential. inconsequential. And they talk about this piece of art, and they talk about the idea that every generation of artists basically um, kills the generation before it, uh, not literally kills it, but makes it inconsequential, makes it not mean anything, because there's a new wave of art and a new way to do art, um, and so the old ways sort of fall into um, disuse, um, and that is all symbolized by this one piece of art that's on stage for most of the play. Uh, likewise, in Peter Pan, you have the ticking crocodile, and it represents the passing of time and future death, and it chases Captain Hook throughout the entire play, so he's literally being chased by time. His time is literally running out. Um, you get the picture. Mood is our last big idea. Now, this is the feeling, the emotion, or tone of the performance. Um, it refers to the ambiance or the aura of what's going on and is often created through a combination of several dramatic and stagecraft elements working in harmony with each other. Um, so basically, it's how the play makes the audience feel. And these are generally everyday feelings such as pity or fear or anger or desire or frustration or love or hope, things like that. Um, it can change throughout the play but usually the overall mood, the, the mood that's supposed to be the most strong is the final, the final scenes, the ones that the audience leaves with. When the audience leaves the theater, how do you want them to feel? Do you want them to feel disgusted by what you, they've seen? Do you want them to feel inspired by what they've seen? Um, the, the overall feeling and emotion that overcomes the audience at the end is, generally speaking, um, the mood that sort of uh, uh, weaves in and out throughout the rest of the play and will definitely affect your designs. Um, for example, if the mood is super gloomy and depressed, um, your design should be you know, dark colors and um, low light, but if it's very inspirational and fun and exciting, you'll want bright colors, lots of light, um, loud sounds, uh, fun music, things like that. Now that we have step two out of the way, we're going to go to step three, which is identifying plot and characters. 
So a lot of times identifying the plot is done through a plot diagram. Um, I'm not showing you a plot diagram in this video. Uh, I'm sure you can find um, examples of wonderful plot diagrams online, but I am going to go through all the things that would be on a plot diagram. Now the plot, uh, so the theme is the, the main idea of what the play is about. The plot are the exact events that happen throughout the play. The first of which is exposition. Now exposition is what happened before the play even started. Now oftentimes this is told in dialogue in the first scene of the play. You'll have someone or maybe a couple of someones come on stage and talk about the world of the play, what's happening. Um, in Hamlet you have uh, Bernardo and um, all of the the sentries and they're on the castle wall and they're talking about how the old king has died and how there's a new king and how Hamlet's not cool with it and about how there's the ghost of Hamlet's dad walking around and you get all of this uh, all of this information at the very beginning of the play and it sort of helps the audience orientate themselves or orient themselves um, they know what's going on and what they can expect from here. It gives sort of an introduction to the events happening in the play and also the characters. The conflict is the main problem the protagonist is facing. So there's different kinds of con uh, conflict and it's important to know which kind is in the play that you're looking at. Now all of these have man versus whatever in them. Um, that's how they are traditionally said. Um, I personally prefer to use person versus because as we know not all protagonists are men. But since that is the sort of traditional way, that is the way that it's going to be said here in this particular uh, video. So the first one is man versus man. This is when one character is at odds with another character. And we see this uh, really well in Les Miserables. Uh, you have Jean Valjean and Javert. Um, Jean Valjean uh, is a prisoner and Javert is a cop and Javert chases Jean Valjean throughout the entire play. Like that is the conflict, um, is between Javert and Jean Valjean. Who's gonna win? Is Jean Valjean gonna win and remain free and escape Javert? Or is Javert gonna win and is Jean Valjean gonna go back to prison for the rest of his life? Um, this comes to a head. Uh, the conflict rises into the climax. Um, towards the end when Javert does let Jean Valjean go, uh, but that is the main conflict. It is one character against another character, and we call this man versus man or person versus person conflict. The next kind of conflict we have is man versus God or fate. Uh, we talked a little bit about Oedipus Rex before and the prophecy of Oedipus Rex. So the whole time um, Oedipus is, is uh, trying to... Uh, sort of win over the gods and the fates. Um, we see this, first of all, in the terrible famine and ir illness that has um, uh, sort of put Thebes down in the dumps. That's where Oedipus lives, is the city of Thebes. And Oedipus is like, I will, I will fix it. I will fix it so that we no longer have people dying and plants and animals dying. Um, and so sort of battling fate or the gods there. And then we learn that Oedipus has actually run away from home, from his home, which is in another uh, country, another city, um, so that he could get away from this prophecy that he was going to murder his father and marry his mother. And then we find out at the end of the play that in coming to Thebes and winning over the Sphinx and um, marrying Jocasta, um, that on his way, he thought he just killed an old man at a crossroads, but really he killed his father, who was the king of Thebes. Um, it's a complicated story, but he ended up that he has killed his father and that Jocasta is in fact his mommy and that he had married her and had children with her. And so um, it's like this big nasty ordeal at the end. But that is, that is the conflict, is Oedipus against the gods or against this prophecy, which is his fate.
In Man vs. Nature, um, it's uh, sort of like man versus God or fate, but it's more man versus just the natural elements. It doesn't have that supernatural or religious connotation. Um, if you've ever seen the movie or read the book Into the Wild, um, it's based on a true story of this guy, and he heads off into, I think, the Alaskan wilderness, um, and he's trying to live off the grid in Alaska. Um, he dies. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but um, he nature wins over him in that. Um, another really good example of this is Mowgli in the Jungle Book. Uh, the whole time the jungle, different aspects of the jungle are trying to kill Mowgli, right? You have the snake, you have Shere Khan, um, and uh, Mowgli ends up not dying. So that's awesome. We have Man versus Society. Uh, so instead of one person, it's a lot of people. Um, a lot of the times, though, a lot of people is represented by one person. Um, it can be, society can be a law. Um, it can be sort of the culture that the protagonist is in, that the protagonist doesn't like. Um, it can be a system of the society. Uh, so the way that the society is organized, that the protagonist um, is in conflict with. Um, a lot of the times the man versus society uh, conflict is sort of situated around one other main character. Um, if you think about it, Romeo and Juliet and their families in Romeo and Juliet, right? Romeo and Juliet just want to be together. They're, the, they're our protagonists. They just want to be together and love each other. But their families hate each other and won't let that happen. Um, so they're big groups of people that are standing in the way of what Romeo and Juliet want. So it's man versus society. If you've seen The Grinch That Stole Christmas, um, the newer one with Jim Carrey as the Grinch, um, we think that the Grinch is against Christmas, uh, but the Grinch is actually against this whole crazy society that the Who's have built up um, around Christmas and the idea of Christmas. It's like this cultural phenomenon that the Grinch doesn't like. So that is man versus society as well. And then our last one, the most interesting one, I think, is man versus himself. So um, where you have a character and they are, uh, they have something about them that gets in the way of what they want. They self-sabotage. Um, the biggest, most dramatic example we have of this is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in Jekyll and Hyde. Um, they're the same person. Dr. Jekyll makes this, um, this potion, and he drinks it, and he turns into Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde's not a great guy, um, really terrible character. Dr. Jekyll then has to find a way to um, kill the monster within himself, which is Mr. Hyde, and it makes for some pretty interesting drama. Um, once we know what the uh, once we know what the uh, conflict is, we get the rising action. Now these are just the events uh, in order that increase the tension of the play, leading to the climax. So once we figure out what the conflict is, uh, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then we get the climax. Um, so they're just the events leading up to the climax. The climax is the point of highest tension and the beginning of the resolution. So we talked about Les Mis, that the conflict was man versus man. It was uh, Jean Valjean versus Javert. Um, the climax is that point at the end when Javert has Jean Valjean. Um, he has him. He could arrest him. Um, it looks like it's all over for Jean Valjean. And then uh, Javert ends up letting him go. Um, and that is the climax. That's the point where uh, the tables turn. Uh, we see how this conflict is going to end. Um, but it's also the point of highest tension where the audience is on the edge of their seat going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is really happening. The denouement, or the falling action, happens after the climax. And it sort of just includes all of the events um, that, that, that end it. Uh, what happens after the climax? So, uh, after, uh, Javert lets Jean Valjean go, uh, Javert, part of the denouement is Javert realizes that he cannot live in a world where that's not black and white. He's a very black and white character. Things are either right or wrong. And he realizes that the world is actually so many shades of gray, and there's so many things that are neither right or wrong, or both right and wrong, and he just doesn't think he can live in that world, so he ends up jumping off a bridge. Um, and 
uh, Javert, uh, Jean Valjean ends, uh, doesn't realize that Javert has jumped off a bridge. He thinks that he's still going to get arrested or whatever. And so he, um, he leaves his daughter and, and her husband, um, after their wedding and he goes and he's very sick and then he ends up dying and Fontaine comes and, and sort of escorts him to heaven. And so it's just sort of how, how the characters end up after the, after the climax, what happens to everybody after the main event is over. All right. So now we've, we've identified the plot. Now we're on to the characters. So the characters are people including anthropomorphized animals and objects. So um, if you've ever seen A Year with Frog and Toad, based off of the Arnold Lobel books, you know that Frog and Toad are characters, as well as Snail and Lizard and all the rest. Um, even though they're not people, like humans, they are still people that populate the world of the play. Same thing for objects. You can have plays where, you know, the bed talks and the desk talks and the chairs talk. Um, again, they're not humans, but they are people that populate the world of the play. Um, now, when analyzing these characters, it's important to determine the following. So who is the protagonist? The protagonist, oftentimes, people think, oh, it's the character that we like. Not necessarily. There are some really uh, not likable protagonists out there. Um, in the play Disgraced, Amir is the protagonist, but he's not super likable. He's kind of a jerk. The protagonist is the character who, who has the obstacle who faces the biggest obstacle in the play and through uh, trying to achieve their goal through the obstacle changes the most. That is the protagonist. So Amir is the protagonist even though um, he gets in fights with people and he has some pretty socially, uh, socially iffy ideas and he does beat his wife at the end. He's still our protagonist. Now, who is the antagonist? A lot of people think, oh, well, this person can't be the antagonist because they're really likable. Well, just like the protagonist isn't the protagonist because we like them, the antagonist isn't the antagonist because we don't like them. Oftentimes, there are some pretty likable antagonists. The antagonist is the person who stands between the protagonist and what they want. So in that play, Disgraced, uh, uh, Amir's wife is actually the antagonist, even though she's one of the most likable play uh, characters in the entire play, because she's standing between uh, what um, between Amir and what he wants in that play. That makes her the antagonist. She is the other half of the conflict. Are there any distinguishable character groups? So these can be family or cultural identity or political or social views or social position. So, for example, Romeo and Juliet, you have the two families. Those are very distinguishable character groups. You have the Montagues and the Capulets, and they need to be different. Um, they need to look different. They need to have different areas of the stage that they call their own. You have different cultural identities. In the play Ragtime, all of the characters are divided into three very specific culture groups. You have the middle class white people um, that make up um, uh, sort of the, the, the upper crust. Um, but funnily enough, most of them don't actually have names. They have things like mother and father and younger brother, and they don't actually have names. And then you have the immigrants uh, that have come over from uh, Europe and the Middle East. So you have those immigrants, and they're a social group. And then you have the black citizens of Harlem, um, and they're their own social group. And these social groups, it's very important to the world of the play that we distinguish them very clearly. Um, so if you're especially a costume designer, you would definitely want to take that into consideration and make sure that the audience, as soon as a character walked on stage, would know exactly to which social group they belong. And then what characters command the space or action of the play? So um, is there a character that uh, drives the action forward more than another character? Usually they're going to be the protagonist and the antagonist, but you also have other characters that help move the action along, um, that help, uh, help the antagonist and protagonist get to where they need to be. Um, sometimes these are things like narrators. Uh, if you have a play with a narrator, um, these can also be um, sort of like kings or queens in the Shakespeare plays that don't really have a lot to do with the 
plot. Um, they're not protagonists, they're not antagonists, but they do set up the situations where the antagonist and protagonist sort of duel it out, um, and they command that space, um, and they sort of say, all right, this is what you're doing, and so they get the play going, um, and it's important to know who those characters are. Our step four are note the needs stated in the stage direction. So, in the play we have our wants and we have our needs. Um, Needs are things that the play absolutely has to have going forward. Um, if you have a play that takes place in a house and people are constantly entering and leaving the house, you need to have a door. If your set has no door, there's no way for characters to enter and leave the house. That is a need. Now, some of these needs are noted in the stage directions. So stage directions happen because a playwright incorporates their ideas about what design elements should look like. Now, stage directions um, are usually in parentheses. Those are those two little curved lines. Um, and in italics, which means they're kind of slanty. So there at the bottom, a door slams off stage, are in parentheses and italics, and that's usually how stage directions um, are written. Now these can be found at the very, very beginning of the play, and they're usually at the beginning of each new scene, and then they're sort of sprinkled sporadically within the action of the play. So he hands her a picture, um, she goes to the window, um, as they leave upstairs, da 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 da. Those are all stage directions, and the first one tells us that somebody needs to have a picture on them, that is a plot, that's a prop that they need to have. One of them tells us that there needs to be a window incorporated into the set, and the other one needs. Uh, the other one tells us that there also needs to be um, uh, stairs in the set if they're going up the stairs. Now, here's the thing about needs stated in the stage directions. Sometimes, as a designer, you can ignore them. So, for example. If um, it says that a character enters wearing a sundress uh, from being at a picnic, you can put that character in a sundress, but you don't necessarily have to. The audience does not read the stage directions. They'll never know the difference. Um, that being said, uh, sometimes the, uh, the playwright um, will have wanted that sundress for a very, very specific reason. Now, you as the designer have to be able to determine if there's a really good reason to have that character in a sundress or if there's not a good reason. And if there's not a really good reason, then you can kind of ignore it a little bit. Um, so, uh, you can, you always do, though, have to take into consideration, um, what sort of environment the characters are in. So, for example, if they say, if it says, um, you know, the characters enter wearing winter clothes, um, like cats and jackets, and that they take them off at the door, and they're talking about how cold it is outside, then, yeah, you probably do need to have jackets and hats. Um, if the setting takes place in the summertime, okay, and uh, it says that the characters come in in summer attire, you probably do not want to put them in jackets and hats, even though it says it in the stage directions, and you could probably ignore it if you really wanted to. Putting them in jackets and hats during the summer wouldn't make any sense. So pay attention to those stage directions. A lot of the time they're helping you and the audience know what time of year it is or the scenario or the environment that the characters are in. So this is an example. This is from uh, Disgraced by Ayad Akhtar. Um, we just talked about uh, Amir in that. Uh, and this is the an example of stage directions. So, the furnishings are spare and tasteful, perhaps with subtle flourishes of the Orient. On stage, Emily, early 30s, white, lithe and lovely, sits at the end of the dining table. A large pad before her and a book open to a large reproduction of Velasquez's portrait of Juan de Pereja. Emily assesses her model. Amir, 40 of South Asian origin, is an 
is in an Italian suit jacket and a crisp collared shirt, but only boxers underneath. He speaks with a perfect American accent, posing, posing for his wife. She sketches him until. So there's a lot in there uh, that the playwright tells us that we need. Um, it tells us what the uh, apartment looks like, that the furnishings are spare but tasteful, um, with subtle flourishes of the Orient. That tells us about the people who live there and what they like. They like Oriental art. Um, they uh, explain Emily. Um, she's lithe and lovely. Uh, it tells us that we need a dining table. It tells us that she needs a pad of paper and a book uh, with a very specific painting in it. Um, it tells us who Amir is and what he's wearing. Now, as designers, you can choose to ignore these uh, stage directions if you want. But I'm telling you, having read the play, that a lot of these are really important for the character descriptions, especially. Um, and knowing who these people are and what their world is like. These, these uh, um, stage directions are really important for that. Now, apart from the stage directions, you can also have explicit needs in the dialogue. So this means in the lines themselves. So at some point, a character might compliment another character on her green dress. Oh my, Sarah, what a beautiful green dress you have. Now, if it's just mentioned in the stage directions, Sarah enters in a green dress, and nothing is ever said about the dress. It doesn't have to be green, and it doesn't have to be a dress. You can design it however you want. But if it's in the lines, if it's in the dialogue, and one character says to another one, oh, Sarah, what a lovely green dress, and you don't have Sarah in a lovely green dress, it's going to be super weird for the audience. They're going to be like, wait, but she's not wearing a green dress, and it's going to draw them out of the play, and you're going to make them think that they either heard correctly or they're going crazy, and you don't want to do that to the audience. So design needs expressed in the dialogue have to be worked into the design. Otherwise, what the characters say will be at odds with what the audience sees. So if it says, um, hey, you want to crash on my futon? And you're doing a set design, you know you have to have a futon there and not an actual couch. Or if it says that um, the wife crosses to the window and looks out... In the stage directions, you don't really need to have a window there. But if it says, if the wife crosses to the window and looks out and says, my, it's looking like a cold day today, it doesn't make sense that she would say that if she's not looking out a window. So if there are uh, things in the dialogue, you have to incorporate them into the design. Um, now, sometimes these can be um, a little less explicit, right? So complimenting on a dress or saying, oh, look out the window uh, is very explicit. You know you need that specific dress. You know you have to have a window. But sometimes it's less explicit. You have to read between the lines. If a character comes in and says, ooh, I hate how cold Michigan is in November, then you know it's November and you know it's Michigan and you know it's cold. If they come in um, wearing a swimming suit, that's going to be weird. So in order to support that line, it's cold in Michigan in November, you would want them to be wearing winter clothes, such as a sweater or a jacket. Um, if you're doing sound design, okay, uh, and a character says something about listening to birds, then you probably want to have birds chirping in the background. Um, or if a character goes, oh, I love this song, you know you need music playing. Um, say that you really want a very specific design thing and it's at odds with what the character says. So say that the character does say, what my, what a beautiful green dress. And you're like, no, I desperately want her in a pink pantsuit. I really, really do. So can we just change that line to what a beautiful pink pantsuit you're wearing? The answer is no. The dialogue can never be changed to fit what the designer wants for a specific design ever. You always have to go with what the playwright has written into the lines, the dialogue. So here we have uh, the dialogue right after that scene from Disgraced, right, where it, it described Amir and Emily's house 
uh, and what they're wearing, how Amir was in a nice jacket um, and a really nice shirt, but just in his boxers, and Emily was painting him, had a sketch pad and was painting him. So here's Amir. You sure you don't want me to put pants on? Because Amir says that, you know that you cannot put pants on him. He has to be in his boxers at the beginning. Emily, showing the Velasquez painting. I only need you from the waist up. I still don't get it. You said it was fine. It is fine. It's just, what? The more I think about it, mm-hmm. I think it's a little weird that you want to paint me after seeing a painting of a slave. He was Velasquez's assistant, honey, his slave, until Velasquez freed him. So in this, you know that Amir can't be wearing pants. And they're talking about the Velasquez painting, so you have to have the Velasquez painting. They can't be talking about the Velasquez painting and you have a Monet painting or a... Um, uh, Rothko painting. It has to be the, Velas the very specific Velasquez painting there. This concludes our um, uh, analyzing the script for design. If you have any questions, please let me know. I know that I went through this very, very quickly. Um, if you need me to go into anything else in more detail, uh, just feel free to either ask me in class or send me an email. I look forward to seeing all the wonderful analyzing you do for your designs.